Hello everyone and welcome to today's event, Understanding Your Eating, our interview with Julia Buckroyd. A very warm welcome to you, Julia. Thank you, thank you very much. It's lovely to have you here with us and a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online. I know there's a lot of people watching already and lots of activity in the chat room, so that's great. Um, Saz is in the chat room and if you're struggling to get in and ask any questions, Saz will pop in our email and we'll, we'll help you get involved in the chat. And I know both Julie and I are hoping for lots of comments and questions to have an interactive time today. Um, so to get us started, Julie, maybe I could um, ask you whereabouts you are located today. Would that be all right? Today, today I'm in, I'm in a, a hotel in Rutland, um, which is the smallest and currently just about the coldest county in England. <laughs> um, I came here with my partner for a weekend and um, we've, we've hit this unseasonably cold weather. So I'm sitting in the conference room of the hotel all on my own, just me and my laptop, um, uh, waiting to hear from all of you. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, Julia, thank you for making time for us in your weekend away. That is very generous of you. Yeah. And, um, my pleasure. My pleasure. And of course, they, they were just heating up the conference room. It's not used at the weekend. So you're just, you're just warming up over there, I guess. That's right. Uh, fortunately, we've got a very efficient heating system, so it's very quickly got quite livable. <laughs> oh, that's a relief. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. So, <laughs> thanks for giving us a sense of where you are. That's nice, and and your temperature, of course. Um, could I ask you a little bit about your professional journey, um, Julia, just to give us a, a sense of you? Yes, please. of course. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my, I trained first of all as an academic historian and I became a specialist in 17th century Scottish history and wrote a couple of books and um, a, a number of articles and had that sort of beginnings of a, um, an academic career as a historian. Um, and the last thing I did was that I had a um, a research fellowship in Oxford, um, which was, as you can imagine, extremely pleasant. When it came to an end, me, oh well, you about get a job, and I thought about what it would be, and as far as I or his, no one wasn't especially interested in, and that. So I then got a job looking after um, a junior year abroad program um, in London, and that's where um, I started to realise that my pastoral duties in relation to those students really required me to be better informed about how human beings went on um, than I was at that time. So I did a, a, a counselling in student counselling. And now among these students, um, these American students, there were students who had disorders. So I was already interested in that subject then. And the very first job I got after I qualified was as the student counsellor at London Contemporary Dance School, where, of course, there were lots of students who had all sorts of problems with food and uh, shape and weight and size. So I was there for five years. In those five years, I worked with literally hundreds of students and then wrote the book that was called Eating Your Heart Out, which was about how can we understand, um, especially young women's, not entirely young women's, of course, some, uh, some men's problems with food. What on earth is that about? How can we understand it? How can we help people? Um, and then I went on, I spent five years in private practice, mostly working with people with disordered eating. And then um, I went to the University of Hertfordshire 
where initially I was responsible for delivering the counselling training. But after five years of that, I was allowed to have a research job. And so I then started to continue the work that I had been doing on eating disorders. And from about 1999, to apply it to people who were um, o overweight and obese, as well as to the more um, easily, the, the better known um, conditions of uh, bulimia and anorexia. And so what I've done in the past 10, actually creeping on to 15 years now, is um, spend a lot of time trying to develop programs to work with people who overeat, as well as be interested in those who aren't necessarily formally diagnosed with eating disorders, but who are very concerned about their relationship with food. And those are very many young women who have tremendous difficulty feeling good about their bodies. So I, as a sort of way of describing all of that work, what I, what I say now is that I work with people with disordered eating uh, to kind of cover, be an umbrella to cover all those kinds of different conditions. So nowadays I have a supervision practice and I'm involved in a couple of um, National Health Service obesity programs and I um, have a... Um, uh, uh, an ordinary uh, private practice where I see people who have these kinds of difficulties. Mm. Julia, you've had the most interesting career up to now and um, yeah, it continues to be such a fascinating journey. Um, yeah, it just sounds so interesting, all the different places you've been and how that's informed um, your work. And in fact, we've got a, a question in the chat room already and we usually say a little bit more, but... Um, I wanted to put this to you because you, you just said something about it. Do you make a distinction between eating disorder and disordered eating? So I guess you've already commented a little bit about No, it. not really. Hmm. <clears throat> no, I don't. Um, at least not in terms of um, conceptualization, of understanding. Uh, of course, somebody who, for example, is a diagnosed anorexic has has a considerably greater risk profile than somebody who is just um, um, starting to um, not eat meals and that kind of a thing. So there is a difference. But if we if if I'm starting to work with people of that kind, what I'm interested in is what is this about. What is this for? What is the meaning of this behavior? How shall we understand what it is that you are doing with food? Because I suppose the thing that I am clearest about is that whatever these various conditions are about, they're not about food. So in the same way that alcoholism is not about alcohol, although you have to think about the alcohol, so eating disorders are not about food. The food is the sign or the signal or the symptom of something going on. And um, I think it's my job to try and help people figure out what that something is. Yeah, so that's how you see your job, what, what you're up to, to try and figure out what's, be, what's below the eating or behind the eating. Yeah. Yes. And of course, there's, in doing that, I mean, that is only the first step because once we've figured out what it is, for example, it's very common that a young woman's eating goes to pot when um, something difficult happens in the family. There's a nasty divorce or um, somebody gets sick or there's um, some traumatic incident. Um, but identifying that is just the beginning because what this young person needs to learn is how to manage difficult events of which goodness knows there are plenty in everybody's life um, and how to manage those in a better way so that she doesn't need to use food. So I see 